Good Friday morning, everyone. My name is Tim. This is the Urban Ecology Center's Backyard Naturalist Series, and I'm excited today to tell some stories on behalf of one of my favorite trees. I know you hear me say this a lot, but this really is one of my favorite trees, the balsam fir. Uh, one of my favorite things about trees is that you may have a favorite tree, like you have a favorite bird or a favorite flower or a favorite comfort food or a favorite Netflix show. And even more often, we have a favorite individual tree, a tree that we climbed as a kid or a tree that gave us shade or berries or a tree on one of our favorite nature hunts. And in the case of the balsam fir, I have a fond memory of this tree, not only because it grows in one of my favorite places in the whole world, the north woods of Wisconsin, where we vacationed every year at Plum Lake, but I also love this tree because once a year we had the silly tradition where we would go buy a tree and bring it into our living room and decorate it and keep it mostly alive for about a month. And then by association, I think I love this tree because it represents the cherished time with people I love, the family and friends during the holidays. Uh, of course, these memories are based on the traditions and cultures of my ancestors. And so to others, the balsam fir will take on a different meaning or just take its place among the many different species of trees uh, we feel wonder towards, like the oak, the tamarack, or the willow, each species having many of their own stories to tell. And before we get started, I'd like to give a special thanks to the registrants with us live here today that it, you all make the pre and post talk discussions lively and fun. I really do look forward to our time together. And if you're watching this recorded, I encourage you to join our Motley Friday morning crew and I'd like to say a special thank you to the Backyard Naturalists who purchased a winter subscription. Your generosity allows the series to remain accessible to the community and all of you are supporting the Urban Ecology Center's mission of connecting people and cities with nature and to each other. And a quick reminder to visit the parent website, UEC in my backyard. And I also encourage you to subscribe to the Urban Ecology podcast available wherever you listen to your other podcasts. Next week is another Yardversity week with a trivia night and a special guest lecture by Forrester Caitlin Reinartz, followed by another Backyard iNaturalist Blitz. And for details, you can visit the Urban Ecology Center website or contact anyone on the research team. Today's trailer is a new Chad the Nature Dad episode. It's a little, little bit longer than our usual trailer videos, but it's worth it, especially if it gets you out to the lakefront here in Milwaukee in the next few days before the weather comes through and you'll, you'll, you'll see why once I show you the video here. So I'm just gonna, we'll all watch this together. Hey friends, Chad to Nature Dad here. In this next video, we're gonna learn about bird murmurations. And throughout the video, you're gonna hear me say, look at that murmur of birds. That's actually not right. It's a murmuration when those birds fly around in that sort of formation and change shape. But nonetheless, enjoy. Hey friends, Chad the Nature Dad here. And today it's going to be a quick one, no Kendall. And that's because I'm on my way home from work each day. I've been driving going over the Hohen Bridge right behind me here. And what I have been seeing is this really cool murmur of birds. So if you look behind me they're kind of swirling around and they might come on over so I'm gonna switch over to a different camera see if I can get a better view of what's going on all right friends so what we got here is a murmur of birds and so what a murmur is it's really these are probably starlings and they are flying around in formation together and there are literally hundreds, maybe even a thousands of these birds going flying around. And a lot of times we see this when we're watching nature documentaries, you know, out on the African plain or somewhere like that. But this is happening right here in Milwaukee, uh, right down on the port of Milwaukee. Some of the reasons why these birds would want to fly and those murmurs would be to evade predators. Yeah, just like fish in the ocean that are living in large groups, they would fly around. These birds also fly around in these large groups, hoping to 
to evade predators. And what's cool, what's cool is that I have been seeing these birds every day coming over the bridge and they come out at about the same time. And look at how cool that is as they get up close and they make those different shapes and formations, yeah. So I encourage you, come down by the Port of Milwaukee sometime around sunset. Get off on that, it's actually the Port of Milwaukee exit and come on down and check out this really cool natural phenomenon of a bird murmur. I'm gonna leave you with just the sights. Yeah, look how cool that is when they come close. I have to say it's quite mesmerizing when that whole group of birds gets close. The feeling that I get is something like being inside of a, a wave of energy as it comes towards me. Hey friends, this has been Chad the Nature Dad here, checking out these super cool murmur of starlings flying behind me join me next time who knows what we're gonna find so i debated whether to show that whole video as i mentioned it's a little bit longer than the ones i usually do as a trailer but uh there like chad said there is just something so me mesmerizing about seeing that and and if you go back to season one we have an episode on starlings and we talk a little bit more about that and there's some great videos and and uh, just the fact that, at least in my experiences, it's, it's hard to predict when you're going to see those things. And so the fact that Chad's been seeing them at dusk pretty regularly, uh, it's kind of kind of like looking for an Aurora Borealis um, or, uh, you know, something like that. It's, it's chances are much better you're going to see them now. So if weather dependent, I encourage you to get down to the lakefront around dusk uh, to look for it. And while you're there, there have been a, a, a couple snowy owl sightings. So look along the breakwaters, look by the salt piles, look around, and maybe you'll you'll also get an extra bonus by seeing a snowy owl. So, okay, the balsam fir. There are a couple of episodes from season one that touch upon the plant kingdom, what makes a plant a plant, and that trees themselves are not in a particular phylum, but trees are types of plants that are found in many different groups 
much like we have vines and shrubs and flowering plants that cross groups. Uh, and we also talk a little bit about mycorrhizae in an episode. We have an episode on that. And in the New York Times recently, there was a really good article uh, about the woman that we feature in that episode and how she kind of went from, from getting uh, this, this reputation that she was a little too flu-flu and not serious as a scientist by saying, kind of shifting the paradigm that forests are full of trees that are in this all out war of competition for light and water and air and space and all of that. And, uh, but, but the reality is, and the more evidence is showing that trees act as a community. And so it's not that Darwinianism isn't happening. There is still survival of the fittest, but the idea that a forest community is stronger and you have uh, trees of different species sharing resources and so it really does kind of take some of our traditional ecological views and, and, and shakes them up a bit. And so it's a really interesting article, as I mentioned in the New York Times about mycorrhizae. And so I'll, I'll send that link out, out to all of you. Um, the balsam fir and the chinkapin oak that we featured in season one are both trees, but they diverged quite a long time ago in the, the tree of life, so to speak. They are both vascular plants with specialized tissue, tissues that transport materials, xylem and phloem, and they also both belong to the seed plants, which are plants that produce seeds. But that's about where the similarities, similarities end, uh, at least genetically speaking. So oak trees belong to the angiosperms or the flowering plants, and fir trees belong to the gymnosperms. In flowering plants, the seed complex is, is encased in an ovary, which later turns into fruits including pumpkin berries, nuts, and acorns. Now, yes, nuts and acorns are types of fruits. And the word gymnosperm translates from the Greek as naked seed because the ovules or unfertilized seeds develop on the surface of specialized leaves that we call cones. There are four living groups of gymnosperms, which include some wonderfully strange plants, the neophytes, which include species that are mostly buried in the sand and they have a couple of raggedly looking leaves uh, that live the entire life of the plant that come out. And I think that's the inspiration for the sand creature in Return of the Jedi. And then you have the ancient cycads that were chomped on by dinosaurs and the ginkgos, which are likely extinct in the wild, but cultivated by humans. Uh, and it is the only species left in the entire class. So these are the, the three of the four living groups of gymnosperms. And then the most popular one are the conifers, also known as the penophytes. So this entire class is made up of woody plants. It's mostly trees with a few shrubs. There are eight families with 629 living species that are quite familiar. Things like cedars and cypresses, firs, junipers, pines, hemlocks, redwoods, spruces, yews. And while the conifers tend to be less diverse, much less diverse than the fruit-bearing trees, they are often ecologically super important uh, as they naturally dominate certain plant communities like alpine forests or even entire biomes like the taiga. And you'll notice that the farther north you go, at least in the northern hemisphere, the more landscapes become dominated by conifers uh, as they are particularly well adapted to cold climates, both physiologically in their internal chemistry and then outwardly they have those downward drooping limbs, limbs that help them shed snow and their, their steeple shape allows them to catch the low angle sunlight that you find in Northern climates. Uh, they're a huge repository for atmospheric carbon and they're economically valuable, particularly as softwood lumber uh, and pulp for paper. Continuing with the conifers, they include the world's tallest and oldest trees. Uh, that I also discuss in the oak episode from season one, as well as the most drought resistant like cypresses that grow in the Sahara Desert. They first appeared 300 million years ago, long before dinosaurs, and the conifer domination lasted until about 50 million years ago with the rise of the mammals, but today they are vastly outnumbered in species diversity by the flowering plants. What I particularly enjoyed for this lecture was that my go-to sources of information were analog, they were paper, they were three of my favorite books. And in many of the episodes, I tend to go to digital sources of information or my favorite podcasts. 
But for this one, I primarily relied on books. And the three kind of go-to books I use today were uh, a Sierra Club Naturalist's Guide that I think Jenny introduced me in college. Uh, and then Donald Colross Petey's A Natural History of Trees, one of my favorites, and The Tree by Colin Tudge. All wonderful books. So if you're looking at at some ways to round out your Backyard Naturalist Library, I strongly recommend all three of these books. I'll uh, start with the Sierra Club Guide as the basis for an exercise that, that you all can use to quickly identify your local conifers. And let's all pretend that we're looking at native trees in Wisconsin. So we start by saying that the conifers all have needle or scale-like leaves, which separates them from the broadleaf trees. If the leaves are indeed flattened scale-like, we are likely looking at an eastern white cedar, which is also known as a swamp cedar or eastern arbor vitae, which are often grown as ornamentals in our backyards. If those scaly leaves are flattened but also rounded, then you're likely looking at an eastern red cedar, which has a more southerly range, and the cones are modified to resemble blue berries. And if it's a lower horizontal kind of growing shrub that looks like uh, some of these, it could be a creeping juniper. If the leaves on your trees are shorter and needle-like and growing in clusters of more than five at the tips of these short spurs that I kind of liken to cigarette butts when you look at them in winter uh, on the branches, you likely have the, the iconic tamarack, sometimes known as the larch, which is a tree that Aldo Leopold uh, called smoky gold because the needles change color in the fall um, and as they fall because it is a deciduous conifer. If the leaves are longer and in groups of about five, you likely have the white pine. Easy to remember because there are five letters in the word white and about five needles per cluster in the white pine. And conveniently, if you find a tree with longer needles in clusters of two to three, it's likely a red pine. Three letters in the word red and about three needle clusters or three needles per cluster in the red pine, although it's often two. Uh, this is something I taught my kids early on and it's something they remember, it's something I remember. So anytime you see a pine, it's pretty easy to identify uh, if you're looking between red and white uh, for identification. If you're looking at a tree with short needles that are in clusters of two, you're likely looking at the jack pine. And the last major groupings of um, conifers involve trees in which the needles are found singly along the branches, not in clusters and not flattened. So starting with the common juniper, which is mainly a low growing spreading shrub um, and the plant from which that berry-like cone gives us gin. If the needles are single and sprouting all around the branches in every direction, you're likely looking at a spruce, which I associate with having prickly needles. And I usually identify spruces by squeezing the needles on the branch. And if I say, ouch, then it's likely a spruce. And we have several spruce species in Wisconsin, uh, both native, like the black spruce and the white spruce pictured here, and non-natives like the blue spruce and the Norway spruce. If the needles are single, and sprouting in two directions in a, a kind of flattened planar way, then you're likely looking at a hemlock. Um, in the Eastern hemlock, the single needles are attached to the branch by a very short stem. Hence the phrase hemlocks have stem locks, uh, which has really helped me to identify them. Uh, and this is another of my all time favorite trees and one that has a hard time establishing itself because deer love them and we have a lot of deer. And then uh, last, but also our feature tree is the balsam fir. And I recognize this tree by the wonderfully recognizable odor of the crushed leaves in my hand, but also the single needles are attached directly to the branch, kind of like they're leeches uh, sucking on the branch. Um, or if that makes you squirm, it just looks like each individual leaf has a suction cup at the base instead of that stem that you have at the hemlock. Uh, and the underside has a couple of those lighter parallel lines. And while the leaves radiate out to all sides of the branch, like the spruce, they tend to grow more like hemlocks uh, out of two sides of the branch so that they kind of bend to form more of that flat plane. But that's not always the case. 
Uh, another characteristic of the balsam fir is that the cones point upward right up until they fall up the branch. And uh, both male and female cones start off with a, a purplish hue, a really beautiful purplish hue, uh, and they tend to turn brown as they age. So that's a very quick guide to identifying the conifers in our area. Um, and I hope that helps you graduate from what I used to do, where I would just call any evergreen a pine tree. Um, but then it was really fun to kind of start look closer and see the differences between a pine and a spruce and a fir and the others. And there are many great resources to help uh, with the conifer identification. Our feature tree, the balsam fir, is identified by the Latin name Abies balsamia, uh, seen here with those upright cones. The genus Abies comprises about 50 different species of firs, but interestingly does not include the Douglas firs. The Douglas firs are a separate group. So if you were to list the groups of conifers like I did earlier, the pines, the cedars, the hemlocks, uh, you would list the firs separately from the Douglas firs. They're, they're not related. The name Abies is Latin, meaning to rise. Uh, since this group tends to be a taller group of conifers, some, of, some species easily reach over 250 feet tall with trunk diameters of 13 feet or more uh, at breast height. The name fir comes from the Old Norse and Old Danish, and so probably is pronounced something like fir, with apologies to my Norse relatives. Uh, balsam firs are medium-sized firs, so if you were to not chop down your balsam fir to bring it inside, uh, and let it grow, let it grow, let it grow, it would reach heights of about 75 to even close to 100 feet tall. Not gigantic, but certainly respectable. Other common names for this tree are the balm of Gilead for a healing resin that was important to humans in the Middle East and mentioned in the Bible. It's also called the northern balsam, the silver pine for the silvery lines on the bottom of the leaves, and the blister fir for reasons we'll talk about soon. So here's the native range for the balsam fir. And you can see at least here in Southeast Wisconsin, uh, it only reaches our houses after a bit of traveling. And you can also see that they tend to grow in cool climates with a mean annual temperature of about 40 degrees. And they can survive temperatures as low as 50 below. And some scientists who had a lot of time on their hands found that balsam firs could survive immersion in liquid nitrogen at negative 320 degrees with no ill effects. Uh, balsam firs like for the roots to stay fairly wet. So they do like swamps or kind of dense flat uh, humid forests, sphagnum bogs, and uh, sometimes they'll grow in high elevations with black and white spruce and aspen and then often in dry or mixed forests like the North Woods, you tend to see them with uh, things like yellow birch and sugar maple and beech. The leaves are sought after by moose and deer and some caterpillars, including the caterpillar of the Isle moth pictured here. The seeds are eaten by a lot of things like red squirrels and grouse, uh, chickadees and crossbills. Crossbills or an aptly named bird that used its crossed bill to pry open the not yet ripe pine cone to get to the seeds. Uh, the trees themselves also provide shelter for many of these same animals and the inner bark is sought after by beavers, especially when they're building dams. Balsam firs are monoecious, meaning this is a word I, I learned uh, from Michaela when volunteering at Washington Park and that means that the male and female pine cones are found on the same tree. And in this case, the, the female cones are at the top and the male cones are underneath to help prevent self-pollination, which it doesn't really want to do. And the pollination itself is carried out by the wind. And like many conifers, the seeds produced by the pine cones are winged. And so they will also disperse with the wind after the cones open up. Uh, or in other cases, they'll be carried away by a mammal or a bird. Um, for dispersal. Balsam firs are late successional or climax species, uh, meaning if you let an area go in the appropriate habitat, the balsam firs will, will come to dominate. But if there is a disturbance in an area, if you have a fire or a tree fall or a landslide, 
then the area will first be colonized by a lot of other species like aspen and birch, uh, jack pine and black spruce. And the shade tolerant balsam firs will kind of bide their time slowly growing up and then eventually taking over as those early pioneer species thin out. But they don't actually start producing seeds until they're about 20 to 30 years old, which uh, makes me think of them as the sturgeon of the tree world because sturgeon also delay reproduction until they're about 20 years old. They have a shallow root base and so are often victims of strong wind blowovers and they're particularly vulnerable to infestation by a native moth called the Eastern spruce budworm. Balsam firs have been used for thousands of years by native populations in North America uh, for many, many different medicinal and therapeutic purposes. Uh, and it would likely take me the entire 30 minutes of this lecture to list the uses. Uh, and please understand that I'm not an expert on edibles, so please don't try any of this at home unless you have a re reputable source. But um, it's reported that the needles can be digested directly off the tree. Uh, maybe, maybe Kim Forbeck has some uh, advice she can give us later. Uh, you can chew the leaves, you can steep them as tea, which are high in vitamin C. And so this is one of the things likely used to combat scurvy, uh, particularly for the European colonial explorers. The bark and the resin are reportedly good to chew and reportedly better raw than cooked, according to naturalmedicinalherbs.net. And one of the reasons this is called the blister tree is that it's otherwise smooth bark is dotted with what looks like these little boils or blisters. And if you pop one of them open, a very thin resin will drain from the spot. And that resin has been hugely important. It's called Canada balsam, sometimes Canada turpentine uh, or balsam of fur, which has been, again, just extremely important to humans over the ages. Uh, it's, it's a resin mixed with essential oils and it's been used in, in so many, many ways as antiseptics and healing agents for burns, bruises, wounds, and sores for bacterial and viral infection. They've been used to treat maladies ranging from sore throats to colds to cancer, from gonorrhea to diarrhea. The oils are used as turpentines, as caulking, as incense, as glues, as candles. Uh, as an EPA approved non-toxic rodent repellent. And one of the more famous uses, although it's becoming a little more historical, is as microscope slide cement. So the resin itself is ideal for microscopy, not only because it's a glue, and so it can glue the specimen to the slide, but it also coats whatever is on the specimen. So, specimen. so it preserves the sample and prevents it from drying out. And most importantly, it has the same refractory properties as the glass itself, so it doesn't interfere with the optics. Uh, in fact, Canada balsam is used as glue in glasses for that reason and other high quality optical instruments. Uh, of course, the other property of Canada balsam oil is that it's highly flammable. So a balsam fir can explode in flames um, and provide a decent amount of flammable materials to the forest floor over time. So this can be bad if you're trying to put out a forest fire or good if, you're, if you want to start a fire in a controlled situation. Um, although green balsam wood is much harder to burn than the dried wood, which uh, also burns very quickly. I personally experienced the incredible combustibility of dried balsam firs in my backyard uh, during my particularly controlled, reckless behavior that I think I inherited from my dad. Um, they do burn very hot and fast like fireworks and, and as quickly as they explode, they die down. So be careful out there, but if, if you're looking for a good fire starter, it's one of my favorite uses for last year's Christmas tree. In olden times, the boughs were a preferred mattress filler before the availability of things like foam rubber or air mattresses. Um, according to PD in his book, the balsam is one of the most uh, generally popular of all the trees of the great Northwoods, except with the old time logger who had no use for balsam save to make himself a natural sweet smelling mattress laid on a springy frame of spruce boughs. 
And from what I've read, there was a very particular way of placing the boughs on the ground or in filling a mattress with balsam for branches to, to provide the softness mixed with that springiness while avoiding the sharp edges and the sticky sap. But going back to where I started, uh, the balsam fir is one of the most popular Christmas trees in North America and one of the greatest exports of Quebec and New England. The Louis R. French, for those of you that have traveled or would like to travel uh, on one of the Urban Ecology Center eco travel trips for many years, was going up and down the coast of the Atlantic carrying Christmas trees. And it's, it's got that conical shape. It re, re, uh, retains its needles very well, that fragrance. fragrance. Um, I think all of those things combine to make it a highly sought after tree uh, and, and also used for wreaths. And most of the trees don't come from the wild, but come from plantations where uh, the cultivating techniques are secretly guarded, highly, highly uh, secret and passed down from grandparents to grandchildren. And in terms of, of all the ways that they cultivate it, in, including pollination by hand uh, and some other techniques. Despite this popularity, it was only used six times as the US Capitol tree uh, in about a 40 year period ending this year. It's also a popular ornamental tree for backyards and parks. And then back to my silly family traditions, after we kept the tree in our house for about a month, we would ceremoniously bring it to the backyard on January 13th, which is King Canute's day, exercising our pagan Norse roots as we would sing and dance away Christmas. So we'd bring the tree to the backyard and uh, dance and sing and throw birdseed in its branches, which then gave it a kind of respectful and useful afterlife before a few months later, I would very unceremoniously try to find an excuse to burn it. And so we'll end with, uh, first we'll end just with this, this fun short video I found of a naturalist discussing balsam fir um, and then I'll close the session with the words of Donald Colross Petey from his book. So let me get this. Hey, Sarah from Roots here in Vermont. And I wanna talk about identifying balsam fir. Common tree species that we see in these mixed hardwoods and something that you really wanna get familiar with and know confidently. So there are a couple of things that we look for. One is that it's a conifer and a conifer that's not losing its needles, these modified leaves through the winter. So we're looking at a tree, it's a, it's a medium sized tree at large when it grows to maturity. Here we have a young specimen. And what we have are these needles. They are spirally arranged on the twigs of the tree, but they generally have kind of a flat lay appearance to them. They are about a half, three quarters of an inch to an inch, inch and a half. So they're pretty long. These are some of the longer needles, ignoring the whole pine family. Um, and that they're a lovely dark green. The younger tips are going to be a lighter green and we're going to see those really kick in come springtime. If you look at the needles themselves, they are marked by these two white bands on the bottom. And if you look really closely, most of them have this slight notching at the tip as though somebody took a really sharp blade and just kind of gently put the tip to the end of the needle, um, which I just find somewhat appealing and lovely. So they have a general flat arrangement here at the bottom, but as they move towards the tapering top of the tree, those needles start to kind of move upright. You'll see that it has cones two to four inches in length at the top of the tree. Bark is something you always want to pay attention to, but you want to recognize that bark on young trees versus bark on old trees can be very different. We're looking at a grayish bark and that as it matures, although from a young stage, you're going to see it filled well, you're going to see often these blisters, these blisters of watery resin uh, that you can poke open, but I try not to because I don't want to be rude, but it does uh, provide a, a resource that's really valuable uh, medicinally and um, 
we use it utilitarian reasons as well. So anyhow, balsam fir is really important. Again, mixed hardwoods, it's really common. We use it a lot in the winter for starting fires with these twigs here. You can see, unlike spruce, which we'll talk about later, it doesn't have <clears throat> the little leaf stems that are prominent on spruce, but are pretty smooth. And we really, pro tip, like it for bow drill as far as a, as a kit material goes. So this is balsam fir, get to know it. I don't know if you can hear that grouse in the background. Uh, when you're confident with ID, you can chew on some of the needles and they have sort of this citrusy orange peel quality that I really like. Something I really like about that video. All right. To anyone whose childhood summers were luckily spent in the great north woods, the delicious spicy fragrance of balsam needles is the dearest odor in all of nature. It brings back the smell of wild raspberries in the sunlit clearing, the piercing sweetness of the white-throated sparrow song, the bird-like flight of the canoe from the gurgling paddle stroke. For balsam loves the rocky soil close to water at the edge of any sparkling lake. So thank you for joining me.